Most of us do it more than once a day. Some of us do it standing up. Some of us do it sitting down, while others prefer to squat. However we do it, urinating and defecating is nature's remarkable way of expelling waste from our bodies. But have you ever wondered what happens to it after it leaves us? In many places across the globe, the journey of human waste is one which takes place along thousands of kilometers of subterranean highways, deep below our towns, cities, and countrysides. Over millennia, we have massively improved our treatment of all things sanitary. So how did we get from waste-infested rivers and streets... It looked disgusting. It smelled absolutely vile. ...to multi-billion dollar poop shoots... It's the biggest project for the water industry that this country's ever seen. ...and state-of-the-art smart toilets. They're the most elegant, delightful, wonderful invention. And we all need one immediately. This is the slightly foul but mainly fascinating story of the evolution of sewers and toilets and the myriad ways they've transformed our lives. Today's digital age has changed everything from people's phones to their cars. And the lavatory has not been left behind. People will spend thousands of dollars on the latest loo in order to give their posterior a pleasant experience. From heated seats to personalized pressurized water settings, the choices are endless. And it's all thanks to the invention of the electronic toilet. <laughs> Following the release of this commercial in Japan in the early 80s, the shower toilet, or washlet, soon became a must-have item throughout the country. Today, the shower toilet can be found in more than 80% of households in Japan, while the leading manufacturer, has sold more than 50 million since its launch in 1980. So Japanese toilets have somehow turned the process of going to the toilet from being this mundane, everyday, somewhat unpleasant thing into a work of art. smart toilets that, you know, connect to your iPhone via Bluetooth that, you know, will remember your user settings. And so now you can get uh, toilets that um, sense who you are and adjust the seat accordingly and switch the seat on so it's nice and warm. It has water jets that clean you from the front, from the back. It pulsates. It's, you can adjust the intensity, the temperature of the water, anything you need. You can have deodorizing steam air drive for your butthole. Uh, well, like, you name it, it has it. These Japanese toilets are phenomenal. They come equipped with a self-closing lid, humorously known as the marriage saver. They can pre-save a, a playlist. It's like, oh, here comes Liv. I know that she likes to listen to rock music while she's having a crap, and so it's gonna play your preset playlist and have everything all prepared. I want a toilet like that. You know, whatever you want, it's got it. it, 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 it it's, it's really quite incredible. Whatever type of toilet you have, in many places across the world, your waste will go on the same journey through a series of pipes and sewers, out to a wastewater treatment plant, and then into the river or sea. But before the age of high-tech toilets and complex sewer systems, the world of sanitation was a very different place. London, the 1840s. This bustling Victorian metropolis was home to nearly two million people, a figure which, thanks to the Industrial Revolution, had doubled since the previous century. And toilets in the city 
were taking the strain. At the start of the 19th century, uh, people going to the toilet would be going to a privy, which was basically uh, a small chamber either in the basement of your house or in the back garden with a wooden board with a hole in it. Once the excrement traveled through the hole, it would land in a cesspool. So a cesspool was basically the brick chamber uh, for your waste. If you had no back garden, it would be in your basement, but otherwise you'd try and keep it away from the house because of the potential smell. No matter where you live in London, from the smallest house to the grandest abode, you are living on top of a big pile of poop. At the time, the only drainage system in the city was for rainwater. The task of emptying cesspools fell to individuals known as night soil men. Night soil was the polite way for talking about poo. Um, and they were called night soil men uh, because they were only allowed to operate at night, the point being that the sheer stink from this would be so objectionable during the day, you had to do it at night. So the waste would be taken out of the cesspool, put in a cart and sold to farmers. But as the population increased, standards in cesspool emptying declined. It was a bit of a mess. There was no real organization. And it would be dumped wherever anyone could find space, um, in wasteland, on the edge of the city, sometimes even in the River Thames. I can't imagine London was a particularly rosy smelling place. In fact, it must have smelled absolutely awful. As the stench from cesspools permeated the capital, another grave issue was gripping London's residents. Cholera. This bacterial disease is thought to have arrived in Great Britain in 1831 on board ships from Asia. Cholera attacks you so viciously, it attacks your intestinal cells. So you'll have immediate watery diarrhea, um, you'll have nausea, uh, you'll be vomiting, and you'll just lose so many fluids, it's like being dehydrated to death. Cholera was a terrifying disease for the Victorians. You could be perfectly healthy in the morning and by the evening on the verge of death. By the 1850s in Britain, there had already been two cholera epidemics, which had claimed the lives of more than 15,000 people in London alone. But it wasn't just the British public who were suffering. Across Europe, cities like Paris were also being marred by the deadly disease. In 1832, a cholera epidemic exploded in the capital, lasting six months and claiming 20,000 lives. Can you imagine what it must have been like? Doctors were baffled. Where was the disease coming from? One popular theory was very much in the air. The consensus on cholera was that it was caused by smell, what people called miasma or bad air arising from rotten matter, so decaying bodies, rotting fruit and veg, you name it, whatever caused the stink in the city, that was the cause of disease. But a British doctor named John Snow wasn't convinced that bad smelling air was to blame. He was fascinated by the cause of disease, and in particular, the spread of cholera in London. Following a cholera outbreak in London in 1854, Snow went on a mission to find the source of this ghastly disease. Essentially, he turned detective. He mapped where all the cholera deaths were happening, and it soon became clear they were clustered around a central point, a pump, a place for drawing water in Broad Street, Soho. What's more, Snow noticed that the water pump was only a couple of meters from one of the city's many cesspools. Uh, and so people were getting their drinking water from very nearby, essentially. There was no treatment, no science, it was just whatever came, that's what you drank. John Snow's investigation helped prove that cholera was caused by drinking contaminated water. London cesspools and even the River Thames were the breeding ground for this deadly disease. Cesspools would typically be emptied about once every year. Now that seems a remarkably long time, but actually they were designed to be porous so any liquid that was in them seeped in the surrounding ground, creating a really dense sludge. And the liquid from these porous cesspools essentially just flowed into the ground around them and ultimately into the water table. So 
In London of the early 1800s, most of the drinking water came from the Thames. So when we had these overspills from cesspools and the raw, untreated waste going into the river, people became exposed and started drinking untreated sewage. As the city's population increased, the cesspools became overwhelmed with wastewater. Plumbers tried to fix the problem by connecting the waste-ridden subterranean chambers to rainwater drains. But this only made the issue worse. Once cesspools get connected to rainwater sewers, where does that water go? Well, essentially, um, London is in a valley, and all sorts of flowing water ultimately must head into the Thames. The Thames was basically an open sewer running through the middle of London. Finally, in 1858, the stench engulfing London reached fever pitch. 1858 was the hottest summer on record, and that heat really made the stench of sewage unbearable. What happens is, is when we're particularly warm, the river level of the Thames will drop, naturally, and what that exposed was the banks where, where many years of, of human waste had, had sort of settled onto the bottom of the river. So when we have human waste exposed on the banks of, of the Thames, um, in addition of, of sunlight and heat, um, what you get is a really noxious sort of fermented waste smell. The smell from the Thames became so dire that the summer was dubbed the Great Stink. Still no action was taken until the stench arrived on the doorstep of the Houses of Parliament, sitting on the bank of the Thames. The government had been aware of London's sanitary problems for at least a decade before the Great Stink. Unfortunately, no one could decide how much money to spend on it or how to solve the issue. So you have a decade of committees, commissions and discussions which basically come to nothing until Parliament gets a final push in 1858 because the problem is suddenly under their very noses. It was so bad, they had to soak their curtains in chloride of lime, which is basically the fancy word for bleach, in order to mask the smell. So that's how bad it was. They chose bleach over the smell of shit. It must have been awful. How did they get anything done? With the city no longer able to cope, the government turned to former railway engineer Joseph Bazalgett, who'd been made chief engineer of the Metropolitan Board of Works just two years earlier. So as a railway engineer, Bazalgette gained experience of land drainage and reclamation, and this would equip him for the task he went on to face. He knew that he needed to take human waste far away from human habitation. They needed to be channeled away somehow. Joseph Bazalgette designed five vast sewers running from west to east parallel with the Thames. The aim was to catch all the human waste that was flowing into the center of the metropolis. Under Bazalgette's system, it would be carried well beyond the boundaries of the city. From the river, the sewage would then be stored in giant lagoons or effluent ponds, which would naturally filter the wastewater before flowing out to sea with the tide. In 1859, work on the new sewer system began. It would take 18 years, 130 kilometers of new tunnels, and more than 300 million bricks to build Bazalgette's sewer superhighway. No one had done anything on this scale in the past. We're talking massive sewers being built through the world's largest city. It was an amazingly ambitious project, and it succeeded. With the introduction of Bazalgette's groundbreaking sewer system, the stench of the River Thames soon became a thing of the past, as did the scourge of cholera in London. More than 150 years later, the process of treating waste beyond sewers is a lot more sophisticated. Gone are the days of Bazalgette's poo lagoons. Now, sewer systems all over the world connect to giant complex wastewater treatment plants, covering vast swathes of land. Most of what we put down our toilets and sinks ends up at one of these sites. Then, after a series of filtration stages, the water is expelled into our rivers and seas. But how exactly does the content of our digestive system get clean enough to be sent out to the environment? At Mogden Sewage Treatment Works in West London, 
Waleed Janjua oversees the day-to-day -day running of operations. Telling people that you work at a wastewater treatment plant sometimes doesn't always go down well. A couple of years ago, I did this presentation to a few school kids, and I told them I work at a poo factory. Never did I ever think that I'd be working at a poo factory, out of all places. But I absolutely love it, honestly. Many people don't realise when you flush the toilet, where does all that go? When it rains, where does all that water go? Only until you come into the industry and you start looking into it as well, do you really give it full appreciation for the job that it is. Mogden Sewage Works serves more than two million people in the capital. Some of their waste travels over 30 kilometres just to get here. So everything that comes into a sewage treatment works looks like this before it's screened. Our screening process removes anything, any solid matter that can't pass through a six millimetre hole. After this process of screening and taking out solid matter, it will come to our primary settlement tanks. Once it gets into our primary settlement tanks, it looks like this. In a primary settlement tank, gravity is our best friend. What you have as solid matter will settle to the bottom of the tank. It's scraped into the centre of the tank. The liquid then passes over to our aeration lanes. In the aeration lanes, we pump in air to promote the growth of bacteria. That larger bacteria feeds off the smaller bacteria, pumps together. That solid matter is then able to settle at the final settlement tanks. Here, like the primary settlement stage, gravity helps the remaining sewage fall to the bottom of the giant tank. This sludge then undergoes a rather ingenious process. But more of that later. What comes over, what's left of that, is that clean water, which we then put out to the River Thames. This is a sample of what we send out to the River Thames. This here isn't actually safe to drink. To get this to a point that we can drink this needs a few more stages, a totally separate process that we do in the business. Over the past 150 years, innovations such as sewage treatment works have improved sanitation beyond belief. But to truly appreciate just how far we've come, we need to go way back. Thousands of years, in fact. The oldest known sewer systems can be traced back to 2600 BC, when the Indus Valley civilization connected latrines to primitive street drainage systems. Ruins from the ancient city of Ephesus in modern-day Turkey show that the Romans were big fans of communal toilets. There's a fantastic example of a really well-preserved municipal toilet. If you wanted to visit, you'd pay your fee, you'd take a seat on the nice, comparatively clean facilities, and you'd just have a catch-up with whoever was sitting around you. They even had a form of toilet paper. I mean, of course, they didn't have toilet paper. They instead used a stick uh, with a sponge on the end of it, which they would use to wipe themselves. <laughs> and of course, clean it before handing it on to the next person, and then the next person, the next person, and thousands of people would wipe their asses using the same sponge that was maybe cleaned with a little bit of vinegar and salt water, if you were lucky. Apparently, this is where the phrase, getting the wrong end of the stick comes from. It's just wonderful to think about. Some ancient sanitation systems were surprisingly advanced. Some even boasted a rudimentary flush. But it would be thousands of years before toilets started looking like the devices we use today. The forerunner to the modern flush toilet can be traced back to 16th century royalty and a man named Sir John Harrington. We don't know very much about John Harrington. We know a couple of things. We know he was Queen Elizabeth I's godson. Um, we know that he was a bit of a playboy, apparently. Um, and we know that he invented a very rudimentary toilet. Harrington's toilet came equipped with a cistern, seat, and flush handle, and was rumored to have been used by Queen Elizabeth herself. But the design never caught on. Some believe this was because it caused a royal stink. The problem was that the pipe connected the toilet directly to the ground below. Its poor design allowed the odor from one's poop to travel back up. Over the next century, various versions of the water closet were introduced across Europe, 
but the issue of backflowing noxious gases remained. It wasn't until 1775 when a watchmaker named Alexander Cummings adapted a key plumbing feature that flush toilets began to go mainstream. He was interested in tinkering in all sorts of things, and uh, one of the things he worked on was perfecting the plumbing of the uh, flush toilet at the time. So he created something called an S-bend, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's a pipe in the shape of an S. Connected to the underside of the toilet bowl, the S-bend allowed water from the flush to rest in the pipe, thus creating a seal or trap that prevented odor from emerging. Over the centuries, the S-Bend would be perfected to make the odor sealing system even more effective. We do still have smell in our toilets. I mean, it depends what you've had for dinner and how many curries, but obviously it's much, much better than it was in the early days of the modern flush toilet. Today, the average person uses the toilet almost 2,000 times a year, spending approximately 164 hours on the loo. It must be the number one contender for the item that most people use multiple times a day and yet so few people have any real understanding of what goes on inside of one. So how does a flush actually work? Um, great, so, um, can I have a phone a friend? Was it, do you pull a handle or push a handle? Okay. Um, Flushing the toilet sets off a chain of events. When you press down the handle or pull the chain, that opens up a flush valve in your full tank of water over the toilet. And so water in the toilet tank drains into the water bowl, flushing away the effluent due to gravity. And then something happens after that. It's the cistern I can't get. Once the effluent is flushed away, the ball cock, which is floating on the top of the water in the tank, has lowered. And eventually it drops so far that it opens the inlet valve, which allows water back into the cistern. So the whole tank fills up with water again until the ball cock reaches the top. And as that flow goes to the top, the valve is closed. Drop them. The tank is full of water, you're reset, and the toilet's ready for the next flush. Very simple, but genius invention. A genius invention it may be, but over the past few decades, all over the world, our flushing habits have become a bit crappy. Deep beneath our cities, waste is taking on a life of its own. The way that we, we interact with wastewater has really changed in the last 150, 200 years, really. Um, what we're putting down the drain is, is didn't exist in the time of Bazalgette. We're putting baby wipes, nappies, condoms, tampons, syringes, even cooking oil down our toilets and sinks, and it's causing huge problems. This careless flush away explosion builds up inside our sewers, causing major blockages. These subterranean beasts have even been given a name. All of this is congealing into gigantic masses of fat and hygiene products called fatbergs. So the way fatbergs form is through a process we call saponification. Um, it's the same process by which solid bars of soap are made, for example. And essentially how that works is if you have chemicals like oils in a sewer, what can happen is they come together in contact with solid materials like, like wet wipes and form small globs of solid material in the sewer. Those can attach to each other and build up to larger and larger pieces until you get a fatberg. One of the biggest fatbergs discovered under the streets of London was an absolute monster. The weight of 11 double-decker buses and the length of two football pitches. It's just beyond belief. The only way to adequately remove these stubborn sewer beasts is using good old-fashioned elbow grease. The sewer workers, known as flushers, are tasked with getting rid of the fatbergs and must wear safety gear to protect them from the toxic chemicals lurking beneath the streets. 
the way that they're removed is actually using shovels, jet pumps, picks in order to break this fatberg into pieces, which can then be physically lifted out of the sewers and, and trucked off to be disposed of. And it's an incredibly dangerous job. There are very unpleasant gases that form in the sewers. And if you're exposed to them, you can be made unconscious in, in an instant. So how can we stop this fatberg invasion? In terms of what should be going down the toilet, three critical things, the three Ps, poo, pee, and paper, nothing more. If you're someone like Walid who works in the waste industry, you'll know that the content of what goes through sewers can vary depending on the time of year. During summer months, we'll get skip loads of sweet corn, a lot of lettuce, that kind of stuff. So they refer to it sometimes as the salad season. In winter months, we'll have a lot of more meat, put gravy on our meat as well, meaning that we'll be putting a lot more fat into our sewage network. As we've already seen, most of the waste that comes from our bodies eventually gets filtered before entering the world's waterways. But in May 2019, a major study revealed shocking findings about the effects of human waste on rivers across the world. From the Thames to the Mekong, scientists tested over 700 rivers in 72 countries and found high levels of antibiotics used for a range of illnesses. They found that some rivers have concentrations 300 times the safe level of certain antibiotics. Things that we've taken to treat urine infections, skin infections, and other medical problems. That's bonkers. The way these drugs are entering our rivers is simple. The drugs are getting into our rivers by pee. We pee them out. These high levels of antibiotics flowing through our rivers could have major repercussions. Superbugs. If you ingest a chest infection antibiotic and then you pee, that goes into the sewer treatment system. Now, if that gets onto a river, and that river has even a trace amount of bacteria that's resistant to that antibiotic, it evolves. Once a bacteria becomes resistant, it can actually share that resistance with other bacteria. The worry is, is that if enough of these bacteria become resistant to a drug, you can get a superbug that you know, renders a, an antibiotic ineffective, essentially. Currently, there's no solution to stop superbugs developing in our rivers. Well, it's a very difficult problem to fix, and it's one that's going to have to involve a mini multi-dimensional approach. So academics, government, we're going to have to come together and really think about the idea of how many antibiotics in the environment is actually safe, and how can we sort of reduce the amount of antibiotics without jeopardizing patient health. But it's not just prescription drugs that are causing a stir in our rivers and streams. Recent studies have shown that high traces of recreational drugs are also present in our waterways. It turns out that London sewers have the highest concentration of cocaine, but in Europe, Belgium, the Netherlands and Germany have the highest levels of MDMA. And also, studies have found that levels are higher at the weekends compared to weekdays, which is really no surprise. Whether legal or illegal, in developed countries such as the UK, these drugs travel through some of the most sophisticated sewage treatment plants in the world. But in a number of areas of developing countries like India, the way in which human waste is dealt with tells a drastically different story. India is a really good example of if you don't have um, enough water or enough money to keep wastewater treatment plants maintained properly, then you get what happens in many cities in India is a, a wastewater treatment plant which is really not functioning um, and it simply gets discharged into the nearest river. What's more, many communities use dry pit latrines. Similar to the days of Victorian England, people's waste collects underground or at the back of houses. Dry latrine is not connected to any kind of flowing water or a flush or any kind of drainage system. It's literally just a basic hole where excrement is collected. Without a proper sewage infrastructure, the task of emptying pit latrines and poorly operating sewers falls to individuals known as manual scavengers. 
Manual scavenging entails people going into the sewers and cleaning out the excrement by hand. It's such a dangerous job because people are going into these sewers via manholes and being exposed to harmful human waste, which must contain noxious gases and major clusters of bacteria. Despite the Indian government banning the employment of manual scavengers in 1993, the practice still takes place, killing one person every five days. Manual scavenging continues because um, it's useful to people who don't want to pay money to improve their systems to put in proper pit latrines or flush toilets or a better system. But in recent years, engineers have looked for ways to put an end to manual scavenging once and for all. Enter automated poo removal. What if a machine could do the work instead? In 2015, a team of engineers got together to create a robot that could clean sewers so that people didn't have to. Named Bandicoot, its creators want to change manholes to robo-holes. What engineers have developed is a spider-like robot that can go down into the manholes and clear out the excrement using spider-like arms that can scoop up and clear the walls of these excrement storage spaces. Still in development, the Bandicoot robot is just one of many ideas that could soon see inhumane manual scavenging consigned to history. Another solution would be to use jet power that is equipped with blades that could cut through excrement that are blocking the sewers. They're also developing full body suits that can protect the manual scavengers from all those toxic materials. With innovations such as the Bandicoot robot, it seems like waste managing technology has gone as far as it can go. But have we got our approach to sewage completely wrong? For millennia, humankind has sought ways to move our effluent as far away from our surroundings as possible. But what if all that toxic matter could be put to good use? As the global population grows and fossil fuels get depleted, our need for renewable energy is stronger than ever. You know, we've been using oil, gas, and coal to heat our homes, run our vehicles, and provide us with the electricity that we use to power all of our devices and almost everything we use in modern, modern civilization. But first of all, there's only a finite amount of them. We're very quickly burning through Earth's natural resources. Um, of fossil fuels that it has stored. But secondly, burning fossil fuels releases uh, a lot of waste products, uh, particularly carbon dioxide. And as we know, that is a major contributor towards climate change. Renewable energy is really good energy because it comes from the wind, water, sunshine, and it can be replenished. It's the most sustainable energy. But there's another form of energy which is growing in popularity but it doesn't come from the sun, water, or wind. It comes from our bums. Known as biogas, this form of energy is created by organic material, such as human or animal waste. And it's produced via a process called anaerobic digestion. Anaerobic digestion uh, is pretty much like a human stomach. So we uh, eat something, it's in a closed environment, and we give off gas, hopefully not in polite society. So an anaerobic digestion uh, works like that. You put sewage in uh, a contained environment. Uh, you deprive it of oxygen. And then the waste is heated up. Uh, to allow microorganisms to break it down, and the byproduct of this process is, is, is a gas called biogas. Today, this powerful poop is used to run a number of living and working environments across the globe. And the best thing about this process is that it can be done on a number of different scales. You can have these sort of small-scale tanks for everyday domestic use, and then you can also have these huge ones that produce energy on an industrial scale. 
So at Mogden Sewage Stream Works, we've got 16 anaerobic digesters. We have sludge that sits in these tanks. We heat it to about 38 degrees. What comes off that, the byproduct of that, the methane, gives us the ability to be able to generate almost one gigawatt of energy, powering almost 80% of our site. Despite biogas currently being more expensive than other forms of renewable energy, costs are predicted to come down in the future, and industries all over the world are embracing waste to tackle a global issue. Prisons in Rwanda, buses in Sweden, um, supermarket trucks in England, um, millions of houses in China. It's really amazing. But back in London, an old waste problem is once again rearing its ugly head. Joseph Bazalgette's groundbreaking sewer system is under strain. London in the 1850s had a population of about 2 million people, but he built the sewers big enough to cope with double that number, 4 million. Today, however, the city's population is approaching the 9 million mark, and this is taking its toll on the capital's sewers. The problem is they're just not big enough to serve the population of London, which is continuing to significantly grow. What happens when you have more people? Well, you have more poop. But as well as the population growth, town planning is putting added strain on the system, as gardens and fields are covered over. As you can see, it's raining quite heavily right now. Back in the day, what would happen, we'd have a lot more green spaces. Rain will get soaked up into the ground. Nowadays, with population increase, with the amount of concrete that we've got, the amount of tarmac that we've got out on the surfaces, rain has nowhere to go. It will soak up into our sewers, and our sewers and our sewage treatment works have only got a certain capacity. So now we have a greater volume of water in our sewers than before. The sewers just really can't cope. There's so much sewage and rainwater getting into the system that it just overwhelmed. As a result, an average of 300 Olympic swimming pools worth of raw sewage flows into the Thames every week. That's a lot of crap to deal with. But at the start of the 21st century, Bazalgette's successors were given the green light for a radical solution, a brand new super sewer under the River Thames. Known as Tideway and running alongside Bazalgette's original sewer system, it will intercept, store, and transfer waste away from the river and into the existing sewage treatment works. We're building on to his original sewer. We're catching the flows where it would have dumped into the river. We're dropping those flows straight into a tunnel and dropping it back into the same sewage works that Bazalgette did. Running from Acton in the west of London to Newham in the east, once complete, the tunnel will be 25 kilometers long, up to 66 meters deep, and seven meters in diameter, wide enough to fit three double-decker buses. It's the biggest project for the water industry this country's ever seen. This will be a sewer superhighway. To build the tunnel, more than a dozen shafts have been sunk into the ground. Giant tunnel boring machines were then lowered which excavated the ground with rotating disc-shaped cutter heads. As the machines bored their way through the soil, prefabricated concrete segments were simultaneously fitted. Meanwhile, thousands of tons of dirt were removed via a conveyor belt and then taken away by barge along the River Thames. We've got several main challenges in building the sewer in London. One, we're working in a very, very busy city. Um, we've got to tie into all the old Victorian infrastructure. And um, we're in some of the most iconic parts of London. And our biggest problem is the land just doesn't exist where we need to build it. So we've had to build out into the river to create our own land to be able to construct our shafts and tunnels. Um, we're also tunneling deeper than anyone else has in London. The tunnel is due to be finished by 2024. Once complete, it will bring much needed relief to Bazalgette's sewer system. London will benefit massively from the Thames Tideway Tunnel. It's going to be a game changer in the way that we look after and we process wastewater across the whole of London. Without proper systems in place, the task of dealing with what happens down below can be a messy process.
But have you ever wondered what happens above Earth when it comes to our sanitary needs? Since the middle of the 20th century, achievements in space exploration have prospered beyond belief. From the first satellite in 1957 to the first man on the moon in 1969, space exploration has grown exponentially in the last 60 years. We've got the International Space Station that's continuously inhabited by astronauts that are always conducting research. And we've got commercial companies that are constantly pushing the frontiers of space tourism. Space expeditions may have come along leaps and bounds, but the issue of relieving oneself in microgravity brings with it some anatomical complications. So what happens up there to our business down there? Going to the toilet in microgravity is pretty hard because you don't have that direction that gravity gives you to make everything sort of flow in one contained direction. It basically means everything can go everywhere. In the early days of space travel, when nature called, astronauts relied on a rudimentary selection of accessories to expel their waste into. For peeing, astronauts had a pee catcher, which basically looked like a giant condom. Pooing was even more tricky because they would use a plastic bag that contained a 1.5 inch opening that had an adhesive seal that stuck to the astronaut's bottom. Once the astronaut had defecated, the contents of the plastic bag had to be mixed with a germicide to avoid the buildup of noxious gases, which, if left unattended, could explode. And I wouldn't want to be in the firing line of that. Since the 1960s, as space expeditions grew more challenging, so too did the need for proper waste management. With the era of the space shuttle, space missions were getting a lot longer. We had more female astronauts who have slightly different needs than male astronauts. And so they really did realize that the, the solutions they were using at the time were not going to cut it, and they needed to invent space toilets. Over the decades, space shuttles were adapted to include a small room and toilet in which astronauts could go for a number one or two in relative comfort. So efficient is the toilet on board the International Space Station that in 2015, a rare tour around the space laboratory's inner workings was given by Italian astronaut Samantha Cristoforetti. Hello, and welcome to the toilet of the International Space Station. Let's say you're up here on ISS and you need to go to the restroom. First thing you want to do is grab this piece of equipment and turn this rotary switch 90 degrees to the open position. What that does is it turns on a fan, which creates a suction effect in this hose so that you can use this yellow element for your number one. For number two, the principle is actually exactly the same, suction. We have a solid waste container here, and on top of it is this uh, seat. Uh, and the solid waste container is connected via this hose to the same fan so that, again, the same suction effects allows you to do your number two in weightlessness. And in fact, there is a bag in, here, in there. It looks like this. And uh, when we are done with our business, we close the bag and we push it down into the solid waste container. And then, of course, as a courtesy to the next person, we put a new fresh bag inside. The um, solid waste container gets changed when it's full, which is roughly every 10 days for a crew of three people using it. The urine actually gets directly transferred to another piece of equipment, which is here in the floor, which is called UPA, Urine Processing Assembly, which is the first step into turning urine into potable water. This recycled potable water can also be used for washing. I think space is, is the future of the Earth in many ways, and not just in, in terms of exploring the universe, but also in terms of how they use their waste, because it's a very small, closed environment, and they have to use it sensibly. Back on Earth, as people across the globe are becoming more environmentally conscious, they're looking for alternatives to the flush toilet in order to save water and recycle waste. An example of this, which is growing in popularity, is the compost toilet. Essentially, a compost toilet is a toilet without water. Um, 
the waste will be directed into a tank with, with sawdust or some solid material. And essentially natural bacteria will break down the waste into sort of sediments and soil. That waste then can be used for, for agricultural purposes as an agricultural additive to help grow crops. It can be used for heat um, and it can be incinerated as well. Meanwhile, the need for alternative waste systems in developing countries has also become a global issue. A third of the world's population still defecates out in the open or uses unsafe or communal toilets. While 4.5 billion people, which is over half of the world's population, doesn't have proper sanitation facilities. At the same time with this crisis going on, it's kind of mind-blowing that we have these smart toilet systems and complex sanitation solutions being developed in other parts of the world. With death and disease rife in countries with poor sanitation systems, organizations all over the world are developing waterless toilets to help improve the situation. You have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and they have the Reinvent the Toilet Challenge and this gives grants to research teams to come up with new ways to look at toilets for the developing world. Use these balls to carry the pee and the poo through the system. Public figures are even drawing attention to the crisis using unorthodox methods. Is a container of human feces. He uh, held up a jar of shit and um, and I've, I've seen the clip and it wasn't even composted shit. It was, you know, pretty fresh. And that's what kids, when they're out playing, they're being exposed to all the time. There are groups of scientists that are working very hard to develop water-free toilets. And I think it's a great way to actually bring a toilet into a place that's not connected to a sewerage network. And it will open up access to, to safe indoor toilets for, for a majority of people if it's successful. One example of a waterless lavatory is the nanomembrane toilet, developed by a research team in the UK. The flush is initiated by closing the lid. Once the lid is closed, the liquids and the solids are separated. The solids are turned into pellets through a combustion process, and the liquids are purified and can be used as water for irrigation, for example. So what's in store for the future of the toilet? I think the flush toilet um, is an astonishing device and has probably saved more lives than many, many other medical advances. But you don't need water to have a safe way of disposing of excreta. The flush toilet is not necessarily the be-all and end-all. It really isn't. And it's time to question whether we can't do better. Over hundreds of years, as the world's population has grown and medical discoveries between health and hygiene have been made, Humankind has adapted its sanitation systems to keep up with an ever-changing planet, bringing us high-tech lavatories, super sewers, and state-of-the-art water treatment plants. In some areas, there may still be a long way to go, but if innovations such as sewer cleaning robots and waterless toilets are anything to go by, the future of human waste is looking rosy.